Coming right up, Straight Talk with Art Levine. Our guest tonight, the president of California State University Long Beach, Dr. Jane Close Connolly, as we continue our 23rd anniversary year. Brought to you in part by the Port of Long Beach, a leader in international trade and environmental stewardship. And the Press-Telegram, your local news leader for over 100 years. And Scan Health Plan, for your health and independence. Join us for tonight's edition of Straight Talk. And now your host, Art Levine. Good evening and welcome to Straight Talk. We're delighted uh, you're joining us tonight. We have as our guest for the entire show the president of California State University, Long Beach, Dr. Jane Close. Connolly, Dr. Connolly, welcome to our show. Thank you very much for having me. How does it feel to be the president here at Long Beach State? It feels terrific. I'm having a wonderful time. Uh, my first eight months have gone by really quickly. A lot has happened, and I've enjoyed every minute. Wonderful. Well, we'll talk about leadership and uh, future plans a little later in the show, but uh, give us an update on the budget situation. We've been reading about... Uh, <laughs> this continual decline in support of higher education, not just in California, but throughout the country. Uh, uh, what are we going to do about the budget and the, the challenges of enrollment? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, budget and enrollment really come together, don't they? So uh, since um, 2006, but even if I went back further than that, the funding for higher education has been on a slow decline and then a, a rapid decline after 2009. So. Uh, Ten years ago, the state was paying for 80 percent of what we did here at Cal State Long Beach, and now it's paying for 24 percent. So that shift has now gone uh, over to students and their families. So instead of being a fully public university, we become a kind of public-private uh, university. And that's, that's the force that's happening across the entire nation, as a matter of fact. On the good news side, um, the cuts have stopped and the, we have a predictable source of state funding. It uh, equals about half of what the system says it needs to meet the needs of our students. So we put in a, a $200 million plus budget at the state level at, at, for a system, and the governor is, um, you know, sent very strong signals that in fact it'll be about $120 million that we'll get. So you can see there's a big gap. There's a, about a $97 million gap and what this means is we can't grow. So for the probably one of the first times in history, the California State University will grow at less than 1%. And that's a tragedy. And we, we had 88,000 students apply for 6,000 places. Last we had, Everyone yeah. wants to come to this campus. Everybody wants to come to this campus. It was 85,091 applicants for 8,000 spots, 4,000 first years, 4,000 transfers. Uh, that's what the state funds us for, and that's how many. We take every California-funded student. Now, the California funding is now less than half of the cost of, the, of a student's education here. So the more you take, the more in the hole you get. That's right. So if we took students that were not being funded, we would be um, really in the hole. So we don't do that. Um, and that's controversial, obviously. But that's the decision to, to maintain quality versus numbers. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah we have, as you know, uh, worked on, uh, long before I got here, but in the last 10 years, worked on graduation rates and gone from 40% in six years to now 65% in six years. That's a dramatic change uh, for the better. And the other thing that's about quality is what happens when students are here? Are they getting the classes that they need? Um, do they have a chance to do study abroad? You know, I was just with students on an alternative spring break. What what are the high impact practices we're offering them? We're not, you know, we're, we're not a fast food uh, campus. We are, in fact, we want to be an exemplary campus with sure. excellent uh, educational opportunities that is still highly accessible. You mentioned a moment ago how we're funding is shifting from the state to the students with tuition increases. But another source is the private uh, funding, and I know you've had a rather dramatic uh, $200 million fundraising campaign that right. kicked uh -huh. off recently. That's right. We kicked off a $225 million uh, campaign in, in its public phase that had been going on privately. We just uh, hit $215 million 
Uh, we hope by this coming December we will have met our goal of $225 million. The greatest bulk of that is uh, for access, so student support. Um, we also are uh, trying to raise money for those kind of transformational opportunities that students would have, like study abroad, internships, research with faculty, and then money for um, greater connectivity to our community, so the greater community, because I think we can serve as a real anchor uh, entity for the region, certainly for Long Beach. You know, we, we gain a lot by being here in Long Beach, California, and I think we can be one of the stalwart kind of forces for economic development, civic development, entertainment, athletics. There's a lot of great things. Your predecessors are used to saying uh, that you can't have a great university without a great city and vice versa, and you probably, I'm sure you share that view, and there is an increasingly close connection between the city and the university. I know, it's a great thing for this us. This used to be called Mausoleum on the Hill, by the way, <laughs> 50, 40 years ago. Yeah, I, I, I hope nobody says that no, anymore I, now. I think no, so. we are really blessed with our mayor, who's a, a double graduate, um, Mayor Garcia, and he promotes us as we, tr we do our best to promote Long Beach. This is, this is really a happy marriage. Of, and he uh, added entities. the city to the College Promise Program. That's right, which that's right. Which we just recognized. got, yeah, and we just got a five million dollar innovation award from Go the Beach. state. Yeah, that, that. Go Beach is right. Yeah, <laughs> and I think having the city involved was uh, one of the compelling and signature parts of this uh, uh, very impressive partnership. Well, I know the mayor is determined to get more internships uh, uh, in the system, both at City College and here. That's and, right. Uh, yeah, and for uh, high school kids as well. To absolutely. Kind of, kind of this absolutely. link learning. Uh, he's become uh, a big promoter of that and getting kids ready for careers and work or at least giving them the opportunity to learn those other skills they need. So as we come to the end of this first segment, bottom line, we're, on the enrollment front, we're going to keep it level, not sacrifice quality. But uh, the state is really short, shorting themselves because I think the studies indicate that for every dollar invested in higher education, four or five bucks comes back. That's exactly right. It's a very short-sighted strategy. We would have preferred, instead of growing less than 1%, we would have preferred to grow 3%. That's a lot. That's a big difference. Mm -hmm. And that's hundreds and hundreds of students. Uh, we, we, it's a heartbreaking thing. Some schools gain prestige by who they turn down. We gain prestige by the kind of student we help develop. Uh, so I would have been happy to take uh, sure. a thousand more students. Sure. Okay, we'll be back after these messages. Are you prepared in case of a natural disaster? Are basic necessities readily available from your home in case of no electricity or running water for days at a time? Preparation is the best defense against natural disasters. For more information and tips on how to prepare, contact your local Long Beach Red Cross. We're back with our discussion with Dr. Jane Connolly, president of Cal State Long Beach. Uh, some unique aspects of our university from your vantage point. Oh, there's so many. Uh, from the pyramid, for example, that houses some of our great athletic uh, events to our fabulous uh, College of the Arts. Uh, I'm so impressed with the quality of the performances I've gotten to come. The fact that we have an accredited art museum on our campus, uh, that's an unusual uh, thing, the sculptures that are all around, and perhaps very importantly, um, our students. 
I've been so impressed by the, the quality and the attitude of our students, so grateful for the opportunities they have. I, I think these are kids who've beaten, many of them have beaten the odds by getting here from low-income families. Being many are first generation. First generation, 40 percent, first generation, first in their family. 60 percent qualify for Pell or eligible, so they're low-income. So, uh, and then topping all that off uh, in terms of a distinctive thing, the faculty are Wonderful. You know, I, I mentioned earlier that I was on alternative spring break. Two faculty members giving up their spring break to, you know, build homes with students because this, they know that this kind of learning will leave a lasting impact. I was discussing this with one of our former vice presidents, and uh, he particularly liked this campus because of its transform transformational quality for the students that come here. Mm -hmm. uh, other schools may have higher academic ratings. <clears throat> But the impact on transforming lives is quite profound here on our campus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that is really a signature element and one that I feel compelled to you know, work on and, and keep making it a really um, true thing uh, and something that many students really experience that wh how, wherever they start when they leave, they're really ready um, to be fully successful in the, in the world, a very complicated and changing world uh, that they enter. Well, no institution is perfect, so let's focus for a moment on what needs to be fixed here. Well, there's a couple of things. Uh, well, there's probably a long list. We, we, if we had a long, we have a long line of people who would have different views. So <laughs> I think, um, you know, very uh, clearly on the physical side, we have tremendous um, infrastructure problems. We've been, you know, with all the budget cuts over the years, deferred maintenance has become a giant issue. So we have leaks and water pressure problems and all sorts of stuff. So that ha we have to address that. Plus, we have to address creating environments uh, that facilitate learning in the 21st century. And that's not just high tech. It just means that we need different sized rooms. We need certainly technology. We need support for faculty uh, to do their best. So, so that's, that needs to be fixed. I think also we don't have enough full-time faculty. Uh, uh, in the last uh, five years, because of budget cuts, we just stopped hiring full-time people. So now we really have to build up the full-time And it's expensive part. to have part-time people <clears throat> come and go. It is, and, you know, and, and many of our part-time lecturers are terrific people that I hope would apply for a full-time uh, position. But you can't build a great university uh, on the backs of part-time people, because they may be here, and then Pomona, and then maybe in the CSU, freeway flyers. Freeway flyers that, as they say, they describe themselves that way. So I think that's uh, a huge thing that needs to be fixed. Let me ask you uh, a broader question on the future, and that is the role of online education. Uh, mm -hmm. To some of us, it, it seems, the economics seem compelling that we, we have to go in that direction because once you get beyond 40 or 50 in a classroom, if the lecturer or the teacher is teaching to 100 or 150 or 200, it could be 2,000 or 2 million. Uh -huh. It's a one-way thing. It's uh -huh. not yes, the interact. dialogue. Yeah. Yeah, so that's right. yeah. uh, the, the cost uh, savings are so enormous. Where do you see us going with online education? I think we'll increase uh, online. Uh, I think we'll do it um, uh, guided by the research that's out there. The best online uh, courses are not cheap to develop. Uh, and they have to be re, um, revised, just like you'd revise your your face-to-face -face class. S um, and when you have large numbers, you need to be hiring teaching assistants to help you manage. Um, but I think the faculty, many faculty, are interested in hybrid um, experiences. So the students are in front of them part of the time, and then that many electronic resources. And if they're designed right, the students interact with each other. You can do a lot of group projects and. So I think our future is to move, uh, at least initially, into many more hybrid courses where a student would be face-to-face uh, -face maybe once a week instead of twice a week. This will help our building situation, too, because we don't really have enough classrooms. We And parking. And parking and all that. So um, some classes lend themselves more easily to it than others at the moment. And we also have a student body that um, we have to be sure that they're ready to take the personal responsibility, time management, 
All of that, this can be solved. They're all smart. They'll, they'll figure that out. But there are efficiencies if you don't physically have to go to that classroom, find, hunt find, for, I should say, hunt, hunt for a parking spot. Exactly. Not guaranteed one. No, exactly, yeah. Hunting license, yeah. as they call it. And we already have online, complete online courses through our Continuing and Professional Education College, yes. and they're very successful. But they're mainly aimed at already working adults, and they're right. pretty narrow. Like, they're, I want to learn how to do X, Y, and Z, and I'm, I'm going to stay up at night. I'm going to do, you know, work on but weekends. Yeah. Do you think conceptually online education is is more inherently useful for that kind versus liberal arts, English, philosophy? I think I, at the moment I do, and I think there's an age issue too. If I'm a working adult, I know what I need. If I'm 18 years old and I'm trying to figure out my major, I probably need the interaction with advisors and faculty to kind of shape sure. what my interests are. So it, it's like in, every, in everything in life and everything in education, there's no one silver bullet. And that's why I resist the pressure from various governmental forces now, get everything online. That's not the answer. We, we've done the research on this. No, there's no question. We can put a lot of stuff online, and our faculty already have. I'd say probably 80% of our classes have online resources. Really? Oh, yes. Oh, resources. Resources, yeah. Resources. Resources. Course, for, yes. So it's not a case of... But you see uh, hybrid courses gradually increasing yes. in the percentage yeah. of... And we have 100 fully online courses. Yeah. I don't know how many hybrid courses we have. So I think... Okay. It, Gradually it will grow, especially as we offer more support for faculty. And they see, if they experience that it helps them do their work better and they get yes. good student outcomes, the faculty will embrace that sure. because they're interested in what's new, right? So we have courses on um, digi the digital world. Well, obviously, Gotta people teaching the that, they're using teach the digital world to okay. teach the digital world. So, yeah. Okay, in the next segment, we'll get up close and personal with the president. Stay with us. Hi, I'm Emmett Smith. Sports has given me a lot to smile about over the years, but as an athlete and the father of young athletes, I know how important it is to protect yourself from injury. That's why I've teamed up with the American Association of Orthodontists to encourage athletes of all ages to play it safe when it comes to sports. I've seen firsthand how quickly an accident can happen when out on the field, the court, or even the dance floor. And because orthodontists are specialists in helping kids and young adults obtain a healthy, beautiful smile, the last thing they want to see is a patient get injured because they weren't properly equipped. No matter the sport, wearing protective gear like mouth guards, face masks, and helmets can reduce the risk of injury and keep you in the game. Athletic competition brings some of the greatest joys in life. There's nothing more rewarding than a lifetime of healthy, beautiful smiles. For more information on how you can play it safe, visit braces.org. There's a movement afoot. Arthritis is America's most common cause of disability. Walking just 30 minutes a day can ease joint pain, improve mobility, and stop the progression of the disease. Start moving now to prevent and control arthritis. And let's move together to raise funds for a cure. Join the movement and participate in the arthritis walk in your area. Log on to letsmovetogether.org and start moving today. When a child is born, it should be the happiest time in one's life. But for some, it's just too difficult to handle. Think before you do the unthinkable. There is an option. Don't abandon your baby. We're continuing our conversation with President Connolly, head of California State University, Long Beach. Uh, what does it feel like to be president of a major university? Uh, well, it feels uh, big. <laughs> it feels like I, it's a 24-7 uh, preoccupation of my mind. Uh, it feels important, especially here at Cal State Long Beach. We talked earlier about the transformational quality of education. Uh, I feel like at this point in my career, that's what I wanted to do. I thought there's nothing more important for the health of our state and our nation is to have educated people. And without that, I think we're in terrible trouble. So I thought uh, I wanted to spend 10 years doing that. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, and I'd also say it feels surprisingly easy uh, at times because, you know, there's a great team 
a great team of uh, vice presidents, of deans, uh, great faculty, uh, surrounding staff. Uh, so at other times when I was in leadership positions, if I had a good idea, I had to go figure out how to do it. Now I feel like I have what I hope is a good idea, and other people go and do it. <laughs> you know, so it, there's there's that kind of, there's that kind of nice. funny uh, balance. It's a bigger job, but I have more help yeah. to get things and done. And give us your view of Long Beach. You, you, you're an, uh, an outsider coming to this new community. What's what's your take on the entire city of Long Beach? <clears throat> well, I you know my first, I, literally my first uh, introduction was when I came down to interview. So I didn't know anything about Long Beach. I love spending time uh, downtown. I think it's exciting. There's a lot of places to eat and shop and walk, and uh, I love the view out. I uh, like the Queen Mary, so it's, it's, a, it's a great place to live. Uh, and I feel like it's a town, a city on the move. I think that there's more that can happen in terms of, yeah. and, the, and that the university can collaborate with in terms of being you know, a hub for high tech kinds of things, the port. Uh, of Long Beach and with LA is such a vibrant part of the city. Sure. It's really opened up new vistas for me to understand how we should be involved in that. So uh, both my husband, Kali, and I are enjoying Long Beach tremendously. A few more cars, I'd say, than Santa Barbara, but I, I've, gotten, I've gotten over that. I found my way around. And a lot of people like the sense of community in the city, that there's a lot of volunteer groups, there's a lot of nonprofits, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, one favorite phrase of mine describing Long Beach is the, the biggest small city in America. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've heard that, and I would agree. And the people have been amazingly welcoming to uh, Kali and me, and I've appreciated that and included us in uh, many things. Sure. Uh, and they care about their university. Even, uh, you know, many are alums who live here, but many are not, and they still care. Uh, and I appreciate that. And you, as president, become a very important person and very visible person in our city. Yeah, I've tried to do that. I try to sm spend as much time as I can out and about in yes. our city and region. Uh, I did visit Orange County the other day for you the first time. You crossed the iron Orange Curtain. That's what people tell me about the Orange Curtain. I didn't notice it when I was oh, by, yeah. but we have 76 <laughs> alums who live or work in uh, Orange County. 76. 6,000, I'm sorry, so yeah. 76,000 alums. Uh, and, uh, so that's a real part of our footprint, and oh, I think sure. we, we need to do more to uh, connect with them and keep them informed about what their alma mater is up to. Absolutely, and ask for some money too. Yeah, th there's <laughs> that too. Or ask them, tell them to ask them to hire our alums or mentor uh, mentor our students or come back and be involved. Let's let's focus in the last few minutes on on leadership because leadership is such is so important to any institution, whether it's a university or a city or a country or a corporation. Mm -hmm. and, and we've seen how we've had transformational presidents here, fortunately at Long Beach State, uh, Dr. Maxson, of course, uh, King Alexander, Don Paris, acting president, and now you. And, and in the 38 years that I've been here, or have been here, it's, uh, it's, it's transformed this university from, uh, from a mausoleum on the hill and just a uh, uh, place to, mm -hmm. to the place that everyone wants to go to. Yeah, yeah. I think we've really been lucky. I, I don't know all of the, you know, the history of the presidents, but I, I am acutely aware that I inherited from the last three, um, Maxson, Alexander, and then Para. Excuse me, and I should mention for the record, President Steve Horn, later Congressman Steve Horn, who that's, had a that's, I didn't 17 get to meet him. years here. Yeah, yeah. that's right, yeah. Uh, that, uh, that they had put together a very effective team and had a clear sense of uh, purpose and mission, and uh, that's enormously important. And I think the process of con uh, connecting with the community was already in place. Um, the role of athletics and the role of arts was strongly supported, and I strongly support that uh, as well. Uh, so I think you know our next phase is to you know put some of that even on more on steroids, more connections to the community because as state support leaves us, we and have. You, to, and you think that's going to continue? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that we, for example, our nursing program. We would not be able to uh, have our nursing program if we didn't. Uh, partner with all the area hospitals. There's real money involved here. Th th that's going to be more common with the kind of programs we have. We already yeah. see it with Boeing, with other engineering, with other you know other other connections. 
it's, we're going to be more, up in, in, in an ironic way perhaps, we'll become more public uh, regionally because we'll be connecting with private industries, <laughs> Molina Health, yep. to really support the work that we do because it, it will be important to them. And it's very important to them that our students are being taught the skills that they need to exactly, hire them. Exactly, exactly, to hire so them. So they have that linkage. Yeah, and that we can offer a student who is uh, trained, certainly technically, but also trained uh, to think, to communicate, to be analytic. Valuable to know how to think. Valuable to know Useful. how to think. <laughs> and not, not, enough, not enough just to know facts. And that's where I think some of the misunderstanding that is nationally present now that you go to college just to learn a profession. That's, that's never a good idea because that profession um, is likely not going to be there uh, in uh, 10 years or 15 years. And it's years. useful if you can write a one-page summary of what your plan is. Um, writing in is English. very important. Yeah, in English. <laughs> Without yeah, Good grammar. I was gonna, good, whatever language they write in, as long as they can do it in good, English, in good grammar with um, not, no yeah. misspellings. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, you know, we're promoting a lot more bilingualism, trilingualism in our students. I think that's part of the future. And we have an important international component on it. Yes, we have, we have 92 over, countries. 92? I was going to say over 100. Well, I, I, exagger up, I exaggerate. Round it up to 100. That's good. Yeah, it's 92 like a countries, little UN yeah. here. You, you it things. is. There's 1,800 uh, international students on our campus right now, and uh, mo most are graduate students. Um, yes. uh, but I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big proponent and been supporting more scholarships for our students to do exchange, to study abroad, of course, to bring students um, here to study here for a semester, six weeks, whatever. Yeah. Uh, we have to manage that so we get the advantage of uh, our students being connected internationally. Uh, on my recent adventure to, uh, to New Orleans on alternative spring break. Which is not a foreign country. Which is not a foreign country. Two of the students who were there, and there might have been more, it was their first time on an airplane, their first time to leave California. Yeah. Our students are often not sophisticated in international ways. So if they can't afford to go, we could bring students here, but we have to make sure that they interact with one another and we give them the, uh, the settings uh, to maximize that. Okay, we'll be back to the rest of our show after these messages. I'm Joe Montaigne. As a father of a daughter with autism, I know the challenges that brings. Military families impacted by autism wage a battle on two fronts one for their country and another for their children. I know you God knows we're in a battle zone. Well, I'm fighting the war back here and I'm fighting it all alone. With one in 88 military children diagnosed with autism, the families face extraordinary challenges, but there is hope. With intensive treatment, the lives of children with autism and their families can be changed. You can make a difference. We've all been waiting for. Maybe tomorrow. To learn how you can help a military child with tomorrow. autism, go to acttodayformilitaryfamilies.org. Thank you. Maybe tomorrow. There's a world of opportunity available through the College of Continuing and Professional Education at Cal State Long Beach. Would you like to move ahead in the field of human resources and personnel management? Sign up for the Human Resources Management Certificate Program. You'll learn how to expand your knowledge and skills and advance in this dynamic industry. For more information, contact the College of Continuing and Professional Education at Cal State Long Beach. I want to wish our guest Jane Connolly continued success in her role as president uh, of our university. Thank you for joining us here on Straight Talk. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah. And let me just share with you that this show will be webcast throughout the world during Long Beach State's graduation uh, week, Tuesday, May 19th through Friday, May 22nd. You can watch it at CSULB.edu. Parents of graduates uh, throughout the world will be able to see and meet uh, our president, uh, the president who was uh, here while their son or daughter uh, attended. So thank you oh, again for joining us. I'm excited about that. Wonderful. Thank you at home for being our guest. Please join us next week for the next edition of Straight Talk. Good night, everyone. Straight Talk has been brought to you by the Port of Long Beach, the Press Telegram, and Scan Health Plan. And remember, Straight Talk is viewable 24-7 at straighttalktv.com.